I'm George Rubin. I served in the Army Air Force in the Second World War, a gunner on a B-17 bomber in England. My name is Daniel Wright, and I'm a senior at Millville High School. Uh, my name is Manuel Melendez, and I'm a senior at the Millville High School as well. So I understand you're a prisoner of war. Um, can you tell me about how you were captured and that experience? Yes. Um, we, I had been flying. Uh, I was on our 18th mission. And uh, let me give you a little background, which might be helpful. It's hard for you to visualize today if you could go outside and look up in the sky and see 800 to 1,000 aircraft flying overhead. It, it would be mind-boggling uh, to, to even feel that. Uh, the contrails, the white trails you see behind a jet today, visualize a thousand of those. It was like a long white cloud from England, France, going into Germany. And uh, on our 18th mission, uh, we were to bomb a small city just north of Munich. Um, if you can also visualize, in a bombing mission, the aircraft are divided into what they call a high, middle, and low wings. In other words, made up of about 40 plus aircraft in three levels. And this is to disperse bombs and to make it easier for the aircraft to stay together because if you're attacked, you can all fire together so it gave you a sense of security. We were in the lead of the low, what they call the low group, uh, primarily because we were not to fly that day, but an aircraft couldn't make it mechanically and we replaced it. It was always a replacement ready. So we were leading the low group. Outside of Munich, clear beautiful Sunday, in February, it's coming up, as a matter of fact, and uh, what happened was the lead aircraft, which has the bombardier and has all of the equipment, in those days it was very archaic uh, radar equipment, they called it a G-box, to find out where you were, he felt that the target was not sufficiently clear and so that he said, we're going to the secondary target, which was the city of Munich. The city of Munich was very, very well defended by the German gunners and by aircraft. And uh, as we made that turn and came towards Munich, we were horribly shot up. Two engines went out. I was wounded. Uh, Co-pilot was hit in the eyes and uh, the plane looked like we were going to have to bail out of the aircraft. As a matter of fact, the pilot so announced it as we lost altitude. And uh, we felt we'd give it a try to find a place to land. A pilot looked for Lake Constance in Geneva, in Switzerland. He felt if we were that far south in Germany, we could make it into Switzerland. Got to remember, it's midwinter, snow covered. This was 1944 was one of the most disastrous winters in Europe, with snow and ice and everything. They hadn't had that in years, and he couldn't find it. So he kept circling through the Alps, and he found a little cul-de-sac, and he said, "I'm going to set the aircraft down here if I can. I don't know where we are." And he miraculously, beautifully lined landed, bellied up, landed the aircraft in a small field outside a village. When we get out, we found out immediately that we were in Germany. We didn't make it to Austria, and we didn't make it to Switzerland. As soon as we got out of the aircraft, approaching us were about 30 young men your age, all with burp guns and machine pistols, because we unfortunately didn't know it. We had landed in a little town called Santofen, which I recommend. It is a beautiful place if you 
It almost looked like Switzerland. It's a beautiful village. And we had landed just outside of that, and in that village was the training center for Hitler Youth. And young high school graduates, men, would come there to train for what Hitler hoped would be the thousand years of his reign. And these men were trained. And they came out into the field where we landed, and they were going to execute us all. They took our officers out and put them against a tree. We knew we'd be next. And uh, if I could write a television program, this would be the type of thing you would put in. All of a sudden, it was stopped by a man that I had never met before in German, spoke to them, and said that they could not carry out this execution until the German soldiers, the Wehrmacht, came because these men were prisoners of war. If I can just fast forward here and then go back again. In 2000, my wife and I went back to this town, to this village, and met this man who had been an officer at the Russian front, badly wounded, had returned to Sontofen for recuperation. And fortunately, that Sunday morning, he was out walking when he saw our plane land and he saw these young men come out to execute us, and he stopped it. And I met him in 2000 for the first time, and we looked at each other, and he literally saved our lives. And once we were captured and the Wehrmacht came, we were led back into the town of Santofen. On the way back, the villages, the men, women, were there with sticks and brooms, and we were horribly beaten. We didn't know it at the time, but the day or two before, the British Air Force, for the first time in the war, had bombed this city, had destroyed the city hall, destroyed a number of buildings. It had never been touched by war at all up to that point in 1945. And so they felt they were taking it out on us. Here was an American crew who was part of this whole Allied situation, and they could take it out on physically. And uh, after we were, the beating was stopped by the troops, they let it go on for a while. I went to a German hospital in town because I was badly wounded in one leg. The rest of the crew were put in jail. The crew made up, when I say the crew, we're talking about nine men. I have a picture here with me of us being all led away by the German soldiers. I'll show it to you afterwards. After my wounds were taken care of in the hospital, I was returned with the rest of the crew into the prison, and we stayed there overnight. 